Good to see y'all. This is called a whole nother ball game. Acts 13. And afterward they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly, for thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. <clears throat> the Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be captain over his people because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. It would be a terrifying judgment to hear that God had big plans for your life but you didn't follow in his will, and he replaced you with someone else. Scripture tells us here that the Lord sought for, and he found David who fulfilled all of God's will. That was one of the things that God was specific about, was that <clears throat> David, had David would fulfill, and in Acts it says he did fulfill all of God's will. So then I began to <clears throat> consider this, and I thought, how did David fulfill the will of God? Right? How was David a man who actually, when his days were over, God said, he fulfilled all of my will? How many want that to be you? God would look at you and say, you know what? You fulfilled all my will. Isn't that an awesome thought? <clears throat> how did David do it? By following after God's own heart. The word heart is a Hebrew word, lebab. It means the deepest, most hidden understanding. How many want to be known by God as one who is in desperate pursuit of the heart or the lebab of God? <clears throat> in order to fulfill God's will, how many know you've got to understand His heart? So this was the $69,000 question. Ask yourself this. Do you pursue understanding? Or do you follow after that which you already understand? You know it's two different things, right? Do you pursue understanding? Or do you continue to just pour into your life things that you already understand? In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, And God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. The word image is salem. It means to resemble and to represent. God created man to resemble and to represent. <clears throat> to resemble is to have the qualities or the features in common. It means to mimic or to imitate. When you have children, many times you'll see them imitate your actions or your behavior. They mimic you. This is the way we are to be with our Father. We're called to resemble, to represent Him. To represent is to be an example. It's literally to be a type of the way, <clears throat> which is hard because we don't understand the way of God. The desire of your heart should be daily, Father, what are you doing today? What is your heart today? What are you feeling today? The word exhaustive in Webster is examining, including, or considering all elements or aspects. Exhaustive is fully comprehensive. It's all-inclusive, and it's complete. Look what God himself said in Isaiah 55, and I read this a lot. <clears throat> my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are <clears throat> your ways my ways, says the Lord. <clears throat> For as the heavens are higher than the earth, 
so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not there, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Now we read these scriptures, and a lot of times we even confess or quote these scriptures, but we're not really sure what God's saying here, and the reason is because we don't understand the heart of God. In order to understand what God is saying personally, how many know there's scriptures where God is speaking personally? There's scriptures where, where Jeremiah or Isaiah or Ezekiel say, and this is what God said. And then there's other scriptures like this one where God is just saying it, and Isaiah is just writing it down. The Lord is absolutely speaking, thus says the Lord. This is me talking. <clears throat> how many realize that there is no, zero, no, zero potential for us to ever examine or even consider all the ways or the thoughts of God. Our time, our ability, our capacity to comprehend, our strength, our endurance, and our ability to pay attention. How many have limited attention spans? How many find that the longer you go, the more, and some of you are sitting there going, what did he just ask? <clears throat> Our ability, all these things that are of us are limited. <clears throat> They're narrow and shallow and restricted. The mystery that we know as God is just as much of a mystery today as when he spoke these words 2,500 years ago. How many know God is a mystery? He's still a mystery. You talk about eternity. I was talking to my dad about eternity before. We have no idea what level anyone's going to end up at. How many of you know that's a mystery? How many know it's going to be a surprise? Surprise! <clears throat> How many don't want him to say surprise and hand you a shovel? <laughs> Right? <laughs> Surprise! Wow. I wasn't prepared for this. I should have brought gloves. <clears throat> How many have ever watched it snow or rain? The Bible talks here in Isaiah, God's talking about snow and rain. How many know that when you watch snow and rain, there's no mystery? You've seen it before. How many ever look outside and go, what is that white stuff falling from the sky? What is this wet stuff falling, right? It's not a mystery. You know what it is. That's what God said. He said, snow and rain aren't a mystery to you. They're a natural thing that happened. God said that snow comes down and rain comes down and we plainly see it because it's a natural thing. But how many have ever seen it rain or snow up? Right? How many know it's got to go back up? The same water that comes down is the same water that goes back up and comes back down. Have you ever watched it go up? Right? There's a mystery. How many know it happens? But it's a mystery, isn't it? That's what God says. He says, you see the rain and the snow. That's the mystery. But you don't see it go back up. You've never watched it return to the heavens. Why? Because it's a hidden mystery. It's a spiritual type of the way of God. Look what he says again in verse 10. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not there, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. In the earth, God is still searching for David's. God is still searching for for someone who's desperate to understand him. He's desiring to open heaven's windows and pour out his rain on those who are dying of thirst. How many have ever heard someone complain, man, I hate it when it rains? Or good grief, when's it going to stop snowing? 
right? How many know that many times rain and snow cause you temporary inconvenience, right? The word inconvenience means trouble or difficulty caused to one's personal requirements or comfort. How many know that every time you plan a picnic, it rains? How many, it's, it's like every time you go to pass a horse and buggy, somebody's coming. It's one of those phenomena. That has, there's not somebody coming for 10 miles that way or 10 miles behind you. But as soon as you go to pass a horse and buggy, there's a vehicle. Right? It's the same thing with rain, isn't it? It's inconvenient. We see it as inconvenient. <clears throat> How many hate to be inconvenienced? You, your time is too important, right? You've got places to go. You're inconveniencing me, Lord with this rain, with this snow. In John 16, Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. For the time being, how many are still in the world? Most of you. If you're not, we need the shovel. <clears throat> you will have tribulation. The word you will is echo flips us. How many would hate an English word like flips us. I've done that on the ice a time or two. <laughs> Echothlipsis actually translates, you will be continually accompanied by trouble. That's what Jesus said. Those words are in red. In this world, in <clears throat> John 16, in this world, you will have tribulation. You will be accompanied by trouble. <clears throat> That's one of the promises that very few Christians confess. <laughs> right? Hallelujah, today I'm going to have trouble. Why? How do I know that? It's a promise of Jesus. <laughs> Here's what you need to remember. Trouble's like rain. It's only inconvenient to those without understanding. In Acts 14, Paul wrote that we enter the kingdom only through much tribulation. What does that mean? God's will is only done through much trouble or inconvenience to his children. Every time you face inconvenience and trouble, that's the only way God can fulfill his will in your life. Isaiah wrote that the inconvenience of the rain and the snow are to supply seed for those who sow and bread for those who eat. You will only grow spiritually in times of natural problem. How many want to grow spiritually? How many are big enough? We're not, are we? He says we are only aware of the natural part, but we don't understand the spiritual part. <clears throat> Every time trouble comes into your life, you're very aware of the trouble. Every time you suffer from something, you're very aware of the suffering. But the part that he said you're not aware of is the, is the invisible part, the spiritual part. The part that he's doing his word goes forth and it doesn't return to him void. When he speaks it, how many know that you don't go through any trouble that God doesn't allow in your life? You believe that? How many ever saw something you said, this can't be God? But you belong to God, don't you? How can't it be God? You belong to God. In this world, you will have, Jesus promised. Trouble will continually accompany you. Why? Because it's an inconvenience in the natural realm, but it does something in the spiritual realm. It changes things in the spiritual realm. It brings bread to the sower and seed to, seed to the sower and bread to the eater. How many want understanding? How many desperately want understanding? How many more than anything in your life you want understanding? How many know what Solomon asked for? 
He asked for understanding, actually. He did. God said, I'll give you wisdom. But the first thing he said was, give me a heart of understanding. A heart of understanding. Isn't that what we want? We want a heart of understanding. God said, because you asked for understanding, I'm going to give you a lot more than that. David was a man in desperate pursuit of the heart, the understanding of God. Why? Because he wanted to fulfill God's will. How many know that we're running out of time? Personally, whether Jesus comes in my lifetime, I had an older guy call me sir. He liked my truck. He was probably in his 50s. Young whippersnapper. And he looked at me before he left and he said, it was really nice talking to you, sir. I swung my cane at him and I missed. <laughs> sir. Right, so we're all, no matter <clears throat> what age you are, whether Christ comes in your lifetime or not, you know, we're running out of time. Carol, Carol said, Deborah's 24 years old today. Wow, I'm depressed over that, she said. <laughs> you know, and it's, when you think about it, and you think about your children and how old they're getting, and you think, good grief. I'm almost old enough to be a grandparent. Someday it'll be a great grandparent. <laughs> and I only have a very short amount of time to fulfill the will of God. And, and the will of God is that I would seek understanding of the heart of God. So that I can fulfill the will of God. Because God is so vast and there's no way that I can know Him all. So I need understanding again today and again tomorrow and again the next day. Who else fulfilled all of God's will? Jesus. Right? Right before Jesus took his final breath, he proclaimed, it is finished. Your entire will is, is done, God. I finished it all. What does it mean? God's will for Jesus was completed. Jesus' personal assignment was fulfilled. But guess what? Yours isn't done yet. Remember what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2. What glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently, but if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, that's acceptable with God. For even hereunto were you called. He said, that's your call. How many don't like Peter because he said that? He said, you're called to suffer and be patient in the long suffering. <clears throat> it's what Peter said. He said, this is what you were called. This is your call. Because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example. How many don't want to suffer? <laughs> right, right? But he said that that was the example he left for us. We thought it was just to be good. And as long as I'm good, I shouldn't have to suffer. Right? I'm only saying these things because it's true. Peter says here, by the way of the spirit of truth, that when you are doing that which is right, or he uses the word well, when you do that which is well, what is that which is well? How many ever thought of that? What, did Peter, what was Peter talking about? The word well is a Greek word that means <clears throat> as your duty or as a favor, you remain obedient and retain virtue. <clears throat> so virtue in your life that you show in your life, that you show through your life actions, you do it through your duty or as obedience it's a favor, right? You're returning the favor. Jesus died for you. The most you can do is die to your flesh, right? How many know it'd be easier to be executed than to die to your flesh, right? One, one bullet or guillotine or whatever, 
and it's over. But every day, I've got to die to this guy. I said to Walton Shaney, I said, you know what? Every day my flesh gets up. And the trouble is he's dressed in wrestling shoes and a singlet and headgear. And he says, let's go. Every day. And some days I pin him. Some days I struggle. I'm in a bridge position, arching, trying not to be pinned. Right? And he's nasty, and he doesn't go by rules. And it's, he never loses his enthusiasm. Never. I say, let me sit in a corner a minute. He says, no way, we're still wrestling. You know what's amazing about Christian nature? <laughs> We like to believe that our obedience comes from our loyalty and our devotion to God. Because it sounds way better if I say, the reason that I'm obedient to God is because, and loyal to God is, is because <clears throat> um, I, my, I've devoted my life to God. So that's the reason I'm obedient. But would we even entertain the thought? See, I entertain lots of thoughts because would would we enter, even entertain the thought that it just may be <clears throat> that our obedience is nothing more than our loyalty and our devotion to our own eternal soul? Who would ever admit that? I, I'm obedient to God because I'm really loyal to my eternal soul. But I would never say that. It's easier for me to say, I do it because I love God and it's all very noble. <laughs> Remember what Jesus said in Luke 17. Okay, you ready? Which of you having a servant plowing or feeding, I know I preach this, but there's so much in this. <clears throat> plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by when he's come from the field, go and sit down and eat. Go eat. But will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me till I've eaten and drunken, and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. He said, I don't think so. So likewise you, <clears throat> when you do all the things that are commanded you say, we're unprofitable servants. We've done that which was our duty to do. How many wish Jesus had never given us this sermon? This is a brutal sermon, this one. This one in Luke 17 is as brutal as any sermon to a believer that Jesus ever gave. <clears throat> so again, and I would, I would ask you to think about this. Just how many think, how many look at your... Your, your own, the reason, the why. How many look at the why of your heart? Every day you look at the why. Look at the why today. What if your duty is that which you do for your own eternal security? Like reading your Bible. How many remember when you started reading your Bible? How many remember? How many have ever read a good novel? How many know it's way easier to, at least when you're starting out, it's way easier to read a good novel than to read your Bible? Makes no sense at all, does it? I can remember as a, as a teenager, as a young fella, <clears throat> and I started reading my Bible every day. And I've not quit. But I thought, I don't get this at all. I need a, I need a dumbed down version. I still read a dumbed down version. The New Living Translation, it's, you know, made for people like me. Because I didn't get it, I would read it. Why did I read it? Because I enjoyed it. Did you read it the next day because you enjoyed it? You read it and you went, wow, what a book. This is awesome. And you read some more and you went, and you went some of the stories are great, right? Because you started in Genesis. But then you got to Leviticus. Right? 
And you start going, oh, good grief. You know, I'm, I'm called to... So why did I do it? Why? Why did you continue? There's something in the human soul. It's the duty, isn't it? You don't have to admit it openly if you don't want. I'm a person I know. So what if you do these things and you're doing them for your own eternal security because you care about your soul? How many of you care about where your soul ends up? Right? Most of you do. A couple of you shrug and say, well, it's up to God. <laughs> what if you pray? How many love to just pray? And you can pray for hours and you get on your knees and just pray for How many know praying can be a chore? How many know it? It's true. Bible reading, prayer. It's not something you would have done naturally. Right? Why do you do it? Because you know something in you tells you it's your duty as a believer. As a Christian, you pray. So you pray. How, let me ask you this. How many could have a whole lot more money if you wouldn't have given it away? Why did you do it? Why did you give it away? Why didn't you invest it? Because something in you, it's not like it's the most pleasant thing. Eventually it can be pleasant, but it's not the most pleasant thing to begin with, right? It's like seeding a garden. How fun is that? How many would rather seed a garden than harvest and eat? Wouldn't you rather harvest and eat? Seeding's not fun. And a lot of this we do. Why? Because we feel obligated. It's a duty. A moral obligation is your requirement to pursue what is right or what you believe. That's a moral obligation. The requirement to pursue what is right or what you believe. Let me ask you this question. How many have ever been an employee? Has, have you been an employee? <clears throat> if you were independently wealthy, would you be an employee? How many would still be an employee? I'd go every day, sweat over that machine, my legs get ache, my knees, right? If you had the money, you would never be an employee, would you? If you were born into a billionaire family, would you go out and seek menial employment? No. Why not? You know why you wouldn't? Because you wouldn't have to. Because you wouldn't be required to. How many like to eat? Yeah. <laughs> right? Why do you work? You like to eat. How many wish you didn't have to eat? Right? How many only worked the vocation that you were or are currently in because you needed the money? You've seen those bumper stickers, haven't you, that said, born to hunt, forced to work. There's other ones too I've seen, born to fish, forced to work, born to shop, forced to work. So they apply to everyone. That describes literally the majority of humanity's feelings about the employer-employee relationship. Am I right? Sure. We mostly work as employees of jobs we don't really like for the purpose of self-preservation. When you're an employee, the hours that you're on the clock belong to someone else. They are rewarding you for the amount of time that you willingly sell them. But you and your employer both realize that you are daily on the clock only because you have no other choice. Your employer knows the only reason you're there. You don't have a choice. Oh, you could change jobs. Another employer, right? Same story, though. And you do it, why? Because you like food, 
and you like shelter. How many know they're kind of an addiction? <laughs> so under protest, you reluctantly get up early and you head off every morning and you do it all over again. Why? Another day, another dollar. But when the whistle blows at 5 o'clock, You're free again. The guy I work with said, there's two times of the day that I love, Dan. I said, what's that? He said, lunchtime and quitting time. I said, I don't eat lunch. I just like quitting time. <laughs> so after quitting time, the rest of the day belongs to you. That's when your duty is done and you're on your own time. A servant in Webster's Dictionary is a person who performs duties for others. How many know that basically that's what you become? We don't like to think that, do we? This, this word is used to describe those usually in today's culture as those who are employed by the government, like civil servants or people that are servants through the government. So that it's, a, it's a word that they use to describe people who work in the government or in jobs in somebody's house doing domestic duties or even as someone who waits tables in an eating establishment. They're, they call them servers instead of servants. People in most jobs don't refer to themselves as servants and would probably be offended by the term. Like if your boss referred to you as his or her servant. And here's my servant, Dan. How many would hate that if your boss referred to you as their servant? <laughs> right? It's kind of degrading, isn't it? But how many understand it's nothing more than semantics? Because if your employer gives you a task to do and you do it, then you're serving them. Aren't you? So that being said, here in Luke, Jesus is discussing the relationship that exists between the master and the servant. There's a relationship. Jesus talks about the servants, this word servants right here. He uses the word servants. The word servant is a Greek word, doulos. Doulos. The English translation of doulos. How many want to know what it is? A slave. One who is bound by chains. In the land of the free and home of the brave, we do willingly sell our time to others as their employee. Why do we do that? Because it benefits us. We become employees out of personal need alone, right? Again, if you were independently wealthy, you would have no need of an employer. In the world, there are those who were born with a silver spoon in their mouths and they will never be an employee but in the spirit realm there is no one who is born rich we're all born into this world spiritually broke and there are literally only two options slavery or death that's it it's slavery or death I didn't make any of this up. This is what Jesus was talking about. I'm just taking his words. As an employee, you only agree to sell a portion of your time to your employer. How many feel like you work around the clock, but you actually don't? Right? Sometimes it seems like it. The lion's share of your time still belongs to you to do as you please. Isn't that true? As a slave, though, what Jesus called a servant, as a slave though, none of your time is actually your time. Slavery's a whole nother ball game. And it's one that we really don't understand, do we? We hear talk of slavery still in this nation. They try to make it a big deal, even though it was ended, you know, over 150 years ago, and there's still people fighting for reparations. None of those people understand. There are slaves in other, how many know there are slaves in other parts of the world? The Muslims are big holders of slaves. 
There are many slaves in many parts of the world. But in the United States, we don't understand slavery very well, do we? It's one that we don't have any comprehension because none of us have ever been that. We feel like it sometimes as an employee, but we're still free to go. How many understand that your life is made up entirely of time? When you give or you commit your life to Jesus, you give or you commit all your time. How much is all? Even as a slave. The Lord really deals with me a lot in this subject. All the hours, the minutes, and the seconds remaining on your life's time clock have been purchased by and now belong to another. He bought your time. As Christians, we declare that Jesus is Lord of our lives and that our lives belong to Jesus, yet we still treat him as an employer and not as a master. How do we treat him as an employer? We do our daily duty, and when our daily obligation is fulfilled, then we feel free to do our own thing. Like we have a choice or an option. So then I would ask the question again, what if your duty was what you did in life to secure your own soul for eternity? What if that's the part where you're working in the field? We said that the servant comes in from the field and he feels like he's done his day's work. And he expects the master to say, take the rest of the day and do as you please. But he doesn't, does he? Jesus said this. I didn't even say this. I didn't make this up. He said, you still belong to me. You are never off the clock. So you do your duty. And what if your duty is reading your Bible and saying your prayers, doing your daily worship routine, going to church or Bible study a couple times a week? What if these are the duty that you have as a believer? You know, a routine in Webster is a sequence of actions regularly followed, a fixed program of events. How many have a fixed program of events? Right? You understand that God is the God of order. And that in order there's much routine, isn't there? God loves that you routinely do your duty. I don't take away from that. He needs you to work in the field. He needs you to do your duty. That's part of your relationship. Reading your Bible and prayer and worship and giving and, and, and all that you do as a believer. That's all part of the relationship. But he says here in verse 10 that the great regret on the day of evaluation will be, I thought that doing my duty was sufficient. Your duty may be hours longer than your neighbor's, but it's still your duty. I believe that on evaluation day, there'll be much weeping and gnashing of teeth over the, over the amount of time that we wasted. So then what is the key to being a profitable slave? We don't even like that thought, do we? A profitable, that's what he said. The English translation made it a little easier to swallow. But when Jesus said it, it was the word doulos and it was slave. So what does it take to be a profitable slave? The word profitable is kriya and it means useful, needful, necessary, wanted, or one who is in great demand. Does God need you? 
Or he's just happy that you're there, but does he need you? Has your relationship increased to the point where he expects you to always be available? Look at Proverbs 4. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear into my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For their life to those that find them and their health to all their flesh. Do you know what makes a needful slave or one that God needs? An attentive slave. An observant slave. A slave that is always watching. A slave that's always listening. Give your undivided attention, Proverbs says. Give your undivided attention to my words. The word words is the word dobar. It means when I'm talking, what I'm saying, when I'm speaking my thoughts, incline your ear. Literally translates, lean in with great anticipation and wait for me to speak. That's what incline your ear means. It means lean in. Everybody that's ever hunted has been like that. You think you heard something. A gobbler in a distance. Man, I can pick a gobbler out. You ask Jude and Daniel, how did you hear that, Dad? I said, because I'm inclining my ear. I'm expecting to hear it, and I'm waiting. And that's what God says. I want you to expect to hear me. But he never talks right away. He doesn't make it easy. Literally, in this world you have tribulation. And there's a lot that comes at you to distract you. Take your attention. You know why? Because he wants to see how desperate you are to hear him. If you're inclining your ear just to hear him. Remember, you're a slave. You don't own a second of your time. You don't own one second of your life. None. You don't even have the decision of choice. I was thinking this the other day. I was going to say this, and, I, and then I thought, no, I probably shouldn't, but maybe I will. <clears throat> I was going to say, and don't answer this, but how many ask the Lord to bless your food before you eat? And people who I know would raise their hands and say, yeah, we do that. And I would say... How many of you ask God if it's okay if you go ahead and eat? And if he says no, you get up and walk away. You know, as a slave, he has the right to do that. Slave, you're not eating tonight. My God would never do that. Then you don't know him. You don't understand his heart. You don't understand his ways. Because he does do that. He does. He's God. He owns you. The part about that is he owns you. He, there's nothing about you that's yours. If he says, don't sleep, don't sleep. I told you last week, sometimes he'll get me up at midnight. And I've only had like three or four hours sleep by then. And I'm ready to get up within two hours. I get like six a night. And he'll get me up at midnight. And he'll say, get up and pray. And he'll go, okay. Yes, sir, I will. And I do. Why? Because he owns me. He owns my time. I don't have any say in it. I'm a servant. Do not I'm a slave to a master. I'm not an employee. I can't even question. How many ever questioned your boss? It took me a lot of years to stop. I had, my boss and I became really close. It took me a lot of years to stop questioning him. But the relationship with us became so sweet when I quit questioning. I just said, okay. It's his company. It's his money. You want to do it that way? I'll do it that way. You know? And our relationship became to where we don't question God. We don't have a, Father, this is what you want me to do? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm yours. Every second. It's just okay. Is anybody getting anything out of this? <laughs> Lean in with great anticipation. Wait for me to speak. This is the daily bread that he longs to share with someone. God has a lot of stuff on his heart. 
that he wants to share. But there's not a lot of people listening. When he says, attend to my words, how many understand he's not saying, attend to the scripture. It's not talking about the Bible. We would rather just read the Bible than wait for him to speak. It's easier. How many know it's easier? Look what Jesus said in John 5. I'm almost done. Search the scripture, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. Jesus said that you can search the scriptures for life, but life is only found in hearing him. That's what he said. They testify of me. They just point you to me. You search the scripture looking for eternal life, and he said life isn't there. Life is in me. Well, there's a new Christian concept we didn't study. Now, I understand that this concept is bigger than you were originally given in Christianity. Jesus said to the religious duty doers, you diligently seek, examine, pour over, and investigate the scriptures, which is the Bible. Why? Because you presume that your knowledge of them gives you eternal life. What does that mean? You can spend your life diligently studying the Bible, but you will never find an actual relationship that comes by studying the Bible. You will never find the relationship with Christ studying... I know this is contrary to what you've been taught. You'll only find relationship in, in the presence of God. There's only intimacy in His presence. David wrote the Psalms, didn't he? You know what he wrote it out of? A relationship. Daniel, Job, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Isaiah all intimately heard God's voice and birthed Scripture from their intimacy with God. What do you birth from your intimacy with God? When you read the Bible, you're actually reading the results of someone else's relationship with God. Well, that's a big concept. It's truth. So then we, can we honestly say that like David, we're in daily desperate pursuit of the understanding of the heart and the mind of God. How many understand that an increasing relationship only grows from increasingly intimate knowledge? We can do our duty for an entire lifetime and never find a truly growing relationship. A man and his wife can share the intimacy of physical union for an entire lifetime, but still be virtual strangers. Why? Because during their alone time, they watch something together, or they read something, or they eat together, or they go visiting together. They may discuss things like family, or finances, or religion, or world affairs. But none of these things create depth in the relationship. Make you go home and think, huh? Growing... Growing relationships are only formed through true communication. Not talking or monologuing. How many have ever been around somebody that just monologues you to death? Right? You're like, oh, somebody shoot me, please. Where's that stray bullet? Right? There's, there's, how many know there's no relationship? There's no even potential. So a lot of relationships, how many have ever noticed this relationship where somebody talks and the other person grunts? How many know that's not communicating? <laughs> how many have ever been the talker? How many have ever been the grunter? <laughs> True communication is always the desire to understand the heart of the other. It's a desire for, to understand, to remove myself as personally from the whole situation and to understand the heart of that person. I don't think that's taught very well, is it? 
Look what David wrote in Psalm 63, last verse. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee. My flesh longs for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wing I will rejoice. My soul follows hard after thee. Thy right hand upholds me. How many know David wrote this out of a relationship? Isn't it literally one of the most beautiful things you've ever heard in your life? And he wrote it out of an intimate relationship. David didn't merely say daily prayers. David had a desperate need to communicate and fellowship with the Lord. Christianity taught you to say your prayers before you go to sleep, and this is a wonderful practice, but how many know there's more? David couldn't go to sleep until he communed with God. David said, I won't sleep until I hear his voice. How many make that your, heart, your heart's desperate cry? I refuse to sleep until I hear his voice today. What if we said that about food? I refuse to eat until I hear the voice of God. That could get scary, couldn't it? How many know your desperation would grow? That's what David said. I won't sleep until I hear him. The word commune is to share one's intimate thoughts and feelings with another. This is the type of relationship that God is still searching for. Someone that not only shares the intimacy of their heart, but someone who God can share the intimacy of his heart with them. That's what God's looking for. For a person who is after his own heart. Amen. Stand with me if you would. Father, we worship and glorify you, for there's none like you. Father, we want to know your voice. We want to hear you. We want to understand your heart. We need understanding of your heart. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, sweet presence of God, we cry out. Teach us your way. Lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Lord, you've shown us that we are slaves. We are bond servants of Jesus Christ. Our minutes all belong to Him. Our seconds belong to Him. Our lives belong to Him. We don't just give Him the ugly part, but we give Him all the parts. We give Him all the parts. We want to know You. Many years ago as an evangelist, I just was thinking about, I, I preached a sermon about my garbage man, his name was Herb Decker. Herb's passed now, but I knew Herb personally. But I said we treat Jesus as if he's like our garbage man. We want him to take away all the ugly things. We don't really have any relationship with our garbage man. Maybe to wave and say hi, we pay him. But we have no real true relationship. There's no true communication. We just want him to take the garbage out. He says, I'm looking for somebody beyond that. Somebody who's willing to give me all of the minutes and the seconds and the hours of your day. Somebody that you're bound to, to communicate with. Somebody that you would say, Lord, I don't want to eat until I hear you. I don't want to sleep until I hear you. I want to give you every second because I want to hear your heart because you're looking for somebody to commune with, somebody that actually loves you and not just the security of their own eternity, but truly loves God. I'm telling you what, the favor of God will be poured on your life. You give him every second, he'll pour his favor on your life like you've never experienced before. And you'll stand in his presence one day 
And he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. And you know what you become at that point? This is what he showed me one day. I didn't write this down. He said, you turn in your servant status and you become sons at that point. And in eternity, he, he welcomes you as sons, sons of God, heirs of God. Why? Because you were a profitable slave. You dedicated every moment to him. Father, that we would dedicate our moments to you even from this day on. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.